stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They represent 48% of the world's population. And they also represent, and I forgot the exact number, but it's about 120, I believe it's 128 of the nations of the United Nations. In other words, they represent almost over 50%. And um, what they are doing is they're challenging the United Nations and its power. And um, they have set up a fund to offset the International Monetary Fund. They are, um, and of course, what they've also done is they've exploited what those promoting, the, using the United Nations to pro promote global warming did. Because see, here's the problem with the United Nations. It's one country, one vote. So you could get a country like the Maldives, you say, well, why have we heard so much about them? This is puny little island out in the South Pacific. Oh, the Maldive government, they actually had cabinet meetings underwater to say, oh, the sea level is going to rise. They were exploited by these other nations because they had one vote at the United Nations. And these countries that were pushing the IPCC agenda knew that if they could get all of these small countries involved and say, oh, well, well we're going to get you money. We'll get you money through the Kyoto. We'll, we'll transfer wealth to you. Of course, they're going to vote for you. But what was the option at the United Nations when they set it up? They could have said, oh, well, we'll do it on population, that you'll get the number of votes based upon the size of your, of your number of people. But that would have put China in control. Couldn't have that. Would have put India much more powerful. Oh, we can't have that. We've got these colonial powers with veto power in, in the, in the, in the uh, General Assembly. So the structure of the United Nations was exploited by one side, is now being exploited by the BRICS nations to counteract the use of the United Nations that Marie Strong did through the, through the World Meteorological Organization. And one of the ways, by the way, that's interesting is that um, India, China particularly, um, essentially getting control of containerized shipping around the world. And one of the ways that you control the world is control the world's oceans. That's what the British Empire was built on. China is also looking at, with the support of the BRICS nations, building another canal through Nicaragua uh, to uh, offset the control that, that the people have over the Panama Canal. So there's a lot of other machinations going on behind the scenes at Paris. But what will happen is it's still political suicide for most leaders to come out and, ch and question anything to do with the environment. And so uh, they will uh, go to, they will say, oh, okay, yeah, we support this. But in fact, they're supporting it in, in uh, name and words only. That's why uh, Elaine Dewar named her book, The Cloak of Green. When she, because what she wanted to do was write a book that praised Canadian environmentalists like Maurice Strong, like uh, pa uh, David Suzuki and all of these other people, Elizabeth May, the leader of the Canadian Green Party, who's going to Paris, by the way, as part of the Canadian delegation. So Elaine Dewar said, hey, these are great people. They're doing great things. She started her investigation, discovered that these people were more manipulative and more corrupt than the people that they were attacking. So she ended up writing the book and titling it The Cloak of Green. I spoke to Elaine about six years ago and said, it's time that you updated the book. She said, I was death threats. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't go near it. I'd never do it again. That's why investigative journalism has been shut down. And, and uh, so this is, what, of course, what's going on. And by the way, what's interesting, Patrick, is the United Nations, I don't know how it happened, but they ended up asking people, six million people around the world, what are your greatest concerns? And they listed 14 that they had to tick off as their greatest concern. 14th on their list of concerns was climate change. It was the lowest. When you look at the Pew Center polls uh, the, on, on social concerns for Americans, global warming is down at 28 on a list of 32 or whatever it is. It is not a concern for the public. 
but yet the politicians still are afraid to say anything because they are going to get attacked by that minority of fanatics who are dictating to the rest of the world. And the way that I express that and phrase that is, um, it's always been that the tail wagged the dog. But what you got now is the flea on the hair on the tail is wagging the dog. And you can see how effective it's going to be at Paris, where Christian F Figueres, who's made a career out of this, will bully all of these uh, world leaders into signing a manifesto um, that actually is, is simply window dressing for a big lie. Right, right. One last, uh, one last topic I think I'd like to throw out and just get your opinion on. There has been a number of, re of uh, reports lately, not probably appearing in the New York Times necessarily, but I've seen some reports float by that um, uh, certain uh, meteorologists and climatologists are um, predicting that we're actually moving into a mini uh, or at least a cooling period based on solar activity and some other factors and so on that they're talking about. And uh, this is, um, it almost, it, it kind of brings to mind that, that the big scare back in the 1970s was global yep. cooling. Yep. Uh, and there's been a flip-flop from that uh, to global warming. And yep. uh, I, the reports I've seen have been largely ignored uh, by anybody else, of course. But uh, what, what do you think uh, at this point, what's your assessment of the possibility of outright global cooling in the next 30 years. I, I think it's almost inevitable. And, and let, me, let me, again, the historic context is so important in all of this. Um, uh, during the Cold War, and as you said, uh, from 1940 to 1980, the world temperature was going down. Some of the older people will remember 1947 as a brutally cold year. And, and um, so, of course, the tr the, they were coming out saying, oh, cooling. Lowell Ponty wrote a book called The Cooling. Stephen Schneider, who became one of the great promoters of global warming, was also saying global cooling is the greatest threat. The CIA wrote three reports that I know about talking about the threat of global cooling and its impact on world food production and the social and political unrest that would follow from that. So, yeah, that, that was uh, what was going on then. But it wasn't a political agenda at that point. It only became a political agenda after 1980 when a warming trend did occur. Uh, the warm, but the warming trend was a natural warming trend. It was due to changes in the sun. It was due, due to changes in the solar cycle. Now, that word cycle is very important because during the Cold War, there was a big deba debate developed between the Western world and the Eastern world. And by the Eastern world, basically, I'm saying Russia or Soviet Union, as it was then, and China. Now, I know about all of this because... I was working in the West, but I had also worked with Soviet climatologists, Borisenkov in particular, who, was, uh, who had reconstructed climate change in Russia for the last thousand years, and also with Chinese climatologists who were looking to increase their food production in their cold regions of Manchuria and the North, and they wanted to look at how Canada was producing more food in a similar climate. So there was a lot of, of, of contact going on. Uh, but here's what happened. The Chinese and the Soviets have always believed that climate is cyclical, that there's a bunch of cycles going on, solar cycles, uh, ocean cycles, uh, cycles in, in, in the cosmology and everything else, and that all you have to do is sort out all of the various cycles, uh, which then overlap and create a net climate and if you could sort out so it's kind of like um, uh, being outside of a stadium and you hear a noise that's a white noise but it's made up of the individual red noises of every person in the stadium so in order to understand the climate and what are the contributing noises you have to be able to track it back to those individual noises. Now, that was the, 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 the West Eastern view. And um, to the extent that the Soviets 
had already been looking at climate cycles affecting their crop productions, and there was a thing called the Kondratiev cycle or the K cycle. It's still being used by people in the stock market. In fact, the stock market is one of the biggest users of climate cycles to predict stock trends. Okay, so that was the Eastern view. The Western scientific view was saying, oh no, it's chaos theory that it's all unpredictable, it's chaos theory. That's where that comment about, oh, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan, you get a storm on the west coast of the United States, you know, one month later and so on. That's where all of that came from. The, the media interpreted all of this as a political division. It wasn't, it was a pure scientific difference in how they viewed climate and causes of climate. The IPCC, of course, have adopted the chaos theory view. And I used to tease them, and I still do. I say, you better hope the chaos theory is right, because it might explain why all of your predictions about weather and climate are so wrong. And that's the interesting part about this, because every prediction they've made, and they stopped calling the predictions, they started calling them projections. Every one they've made has been wrong. Well, if your predictions are wrong, your science is wrong. End of story. That's what, that's what the great physicist Feynman said. If your prediction is wrong, your science is wrong. But they, but they ignored that. And so uh, this, this is the, the uh, pattern. Now, the solar cycles, uh, we've known for a long time that the number of sunspots correlates with global temperature. So when there are a lot of sunspots, the Earth is warmer. When there are very few sunspots, the Earth is